Hello, and welcome to Tech Connects, Dice's podcast where we dig into the topics on tech hiring, recruiting, and careers that matter to you. I'm your host, Nick Kolakowski, and I'm going to talk to great guests every month about the current state of the tech careers world, including the tech job market, the hottest tech skills, what companies are doing to attract and retain technology professionals in a historically tight market, and much more. Our next guest is Catherine Minshew, the CEO and founder of The Muse, a website devoted to providing jobs, coaching, and advice to the next generation of job seekers. The site's content covers everything that job candidates need to succeed in a dynamic and often uncertain job environment, from common interview questions to the need for soft skills to overcoming imposter syndrome. Her position gives Catherine extraordinary insight into the job market at the moment. Let's listen in as we talk about everything from the current economic environment to remote work to finding purpose in your job. I just, I wanted to just start off in addition to the talking point, just kind of digging into, I mean, you founded the Muse to help the next generation of job seekers with training and advice and all the rest of that good stuff. And the market right now is really turbulent. I was just talking to an economist who was saying that she couldn't make hide nor hair of anything going on. You know, inflation is rampant. You know, unemployment is like really stable, though. You know, there's all these hints of a recession, and yet a lot of companies are hiring. And I imagine that for the Muse's target audience, it must be confusing. And in turn, that probably changes your approach to kind of the information you're presenting them, the training. I mean, like, just what's the environment out there, like for the for the core audience? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a really interesting time, as you say. I think we're still seeing that job seekers expect to be able to vocalize their preferences and have their top priorities met, even in the you know in an environment that. Um, from a macro perspective, seems to be favoring employers a bit more. And I think that's sign, a sign of like this underlying shift, which is, you know, 20 years ago, there was more of this narrative that, you know, work's work, you get paid, you show up, you clock in, you clock out. Now, not only are we all connected through our smartphones, we're expected to often be responsive and available 24 hours a day in some cases, um, but there's also this general narrative that, Work is a source of learning and growth opportunities. It might be where you find a sense of purpose and meaning. It should be flexible. I I kind of think that this transition is sort of like the one that um, marriage went through. You had you know marriage of convenience, uh, and and now you have sort of marriage of love and of fulfillment and of growth and etc. And by the way, you still have people out there that are like, I want a partner who does X Y Z and doesn't bother me. And if that's what you want and you're clear, you can find that person. If you just want a job that kind of pays you, provides nothing else, and doesn't ask much more from you, you can find that job. That's okay. You know, humans have a lot of choices. And and I think what a lot of employers are missing, uh, because I've been reading all of these think pieces about how employers have the power now. And it's like, well, if you want to provide the bare minimum to your employees, you will get employees who give you often the bare minimum right back. That's why we're hearing about quiet quitting. It's why we're hearing about, um, you know, all of these different buzzwords and catchphrases that basically come down to, I will do exactly the amount of work that I am being paid for and no more. That is a employee perspective that I think matches the employer perspective of, I pay you, so show up, do the work and shut up. Okay, fine. If everybody's on board, but that's the arrangement, great. And, and, and you have an entire other side of the labor force and an entire other kind of employer philosophy, which says for individuals, I want more out of work. I have these expectations. I'm looking for a job that aligns with my values, my preferences, my priorities. And the employers that want to attract those people are often, you know, they're, they're the people that often go above and beyond, but they are expecting employers to, you know, to provide more than just a salary. So I think it's interesting. I think we're going to see a, um, you know, more differentiation in how these kind of two groups of employers and employees find each other um, is obviously something that we're, you know, we're pretty concerned with at the Muse. Yeah, no, I'm sure. The, um, for a long time there, I mean, to your point about quiet quitting, there was also the great resignation and all these companies were up in arms because people, you know, and understandably, if employees didn't get what they wanted, if they didn't feel fulfilled, they were walking out the door and the labor market seemed to accommodate that. And, you know, there's all sorts of job opportunities out there. Do you think that companies, and this goes to the point you were also making about how some companies are trying to kind of step up and provide those things and other ones are not, do you think that that caused sort of a seismic shift that more executives kind of woke up and said, hey, there's all this quiet quitting, there's this great resignation, we need to kind of adjust our strategy and everything? Or do you think it's kind of been more incremental that companies quite, that it's taken more time for companies to kind of figure out and, and adapt to that? Um, it's a mix 
I do think that the shift was pretty dramatic in mm -hmm. that many, many more executives and leaders realized that their mm -hmm. employees have the full freedom to go somewhere else if they're not happy with the opportunity they have at your company. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are plenty of people who didn't draw that conclusion who continue to either adopt slowly, um, adapt slowly, or they perhaps don't agree at all. And they're, you know, they're deliberately choosing another approach. But I do think the, res the great resignation was pretty seismic and it, and it kind of dovetailed with another shift, which is how long employees will stay at a job that isn't mm. a good fit. Um, you know, I, I wrote about this term that we coined at the Muse called shift shock, which is the idea of someone starting a new job and realizing with surprise or regret that it's not at all like what you expected. 72% um, of the American workforce said that they have experienced shift shock at one point or another. But what was most interesting to me about the survey we did was that 80% of Gen Z and millennial employees said that they would leave a new job in under six months if it didn't kind of align with the expectations that they had when they joined. That is a huge change. You know, I am in my late 30s. When I first started work, I was at McKinsey and Company, and they very clearly said, you accepted this job. Now you need to stay here for at least two years and give it your all. Otherwise, it'll be a black mark on your resume that will follow you for the rest of your career. And that's actually, that's not, that's not true in the same way anymore for most candidates and most employers. Now, if you have multiple short stints, if you're constantly joining and leaving, joining and leaving, it's going to hurt you for sure. But if you have a resume with a couple of long stints and one or two very short stints sprinkled in, um, I can't tell you how many candidates, you know, have seen this. And if you ask them what, what happened or what's gone on, they'll say, well, you know, I got in the new job and it was a real values misalignment. I started the new job and it was not at all what they promised me. And most interview interviewers these days are like, yeah, okay, that tracks. I'm still interested. So that's a big generational shift that I think is, is sort of upping the pressure on employers to be honest and accurate and straightforward before they hire. Um, and it's also, again, it's causing more uh, job change because, in, you know, someone who's unhappy, there's less pressure on them to kind of grit their teeth and, you know, stick it out for two years. I mean, I'm in the same age range. So, I mean, I, that, that was the exact same advice that you deep six your career if they looked at it and, you know, it was five jobs in five years or something like that. Um, what can companies do in terms, I mean, for that dichotomy between kind of the expectations and then the reality once they arrive, what can companies do to actually potentially avoid that before it becomes a serious problem for people who are joining the company? Is it a matter of I, just how the interviewer frames the job? Is it, you know, kind of adjusting the corporate website or something like that? I mean, there are, I, I would think there'd be a solution here. I mean, it seems, yeah. yeah. There is absolutely a solution and it's to be more transparent before people join about what they will find when they arrive. Um, there's a couple of ingredients to that. I think the way you talk about your company publicly on the careers page, on the website and on your social channels is part of it. Mm -hmm. The information you give your interviewers about how to communicate the company culture is part of it. And I also think um, a piece that sometimes companies miss is you have to actually know what it's like to work at your company in specific teams or specific roles before you can communicate that. So one of the tools that uh, I really love that's it was kind of part of the muse, but we actually acquired it. It was a startup called Brand Amper that we acquired and we now incorporated as Brand Builder. And it actually just lets a company tap its engineers, its salespeople, its finance people, you know, all its different employees for real life insights and data about what it's like to work there. And you don't, by the way, have to use this tool or any other tool. You can also do focus groups or an anonymous survey. And there's a lot of things you can do in small companies. You may sit right next to them and not need to collect data. But what's important is the people talking to candidates and the materials that candidates need that are consu that, that candidates are consuming, they need to match the reality. And to do that, you need to understand what what are you telling candidates? Because by the way, like candidates are asking questions. If they're not asking questions, you probably have another problem. They may not be, you know, a candidate that's that's um, got a lot of other options. Most candidates are asking. What's the work environment like? What are the expectations in this role? What hours do people typically work? You know, how often, how fast will I be expected to reply? Like candidates are asking questions and the more that they are getting real answers, the better they will be able to you know, self-select in or self-select out. It's much more damaging for a company to have someone join and then quit two, three, six months in than it is for that person to decide not to join at all. I imagine also, I mean, because there's so many resources online like Glassdoor and so on, where people obviously on the job hunt go and, you know, they're looking for and they're reading the reviews and all the rest of it. So that if you started up something like that internally, it would, I don't want to say mitigate because that sort of implies that a company is doing damage control, but it, at least it would potentially balance out what people are maybe reading online. So it'd be beneficial to to have that. Um, 
But I can also imagine that companies, I could be, I, I can imagine like some executive somewhere freaking out at the idea of kind of opening up that communication channel and having employees talking directly and so on to candidates about their experiences and things like that. Um, so well, I imagine. No. I will say that the the output of Brand Builder goes to the people who run it. It doesn't go directly to candidates. So I think okay. that is an important, important thing. Um, I, I empathize with the fact, and we, we talk to a lot of recruiters, HR leaders, talent acquisition leaders, um, as we you know have, have kind of invested in this tool over time. And I get it. Like they've very consistently said, we want candidates to be able to hear the employee perspective, but we're afraid of creating a free-for-all. Like I understand that. You need to have some sort of, um, you know, again, many candidates will reach out to employees, but to the extent that it's being facilitated by HR, you do want to think about, all right, you know, how do we collect this candidate information and then use that to highlight specific employee stories, put uh, quotes that employees have you know, submitted and said that they're okay with standing behind on our website or on our social. So I think that there, there's a role for the employer to play, the HR team to play. You can affect and craft and think about your brand. You just have to make sure that it's that it aligns with the actual experience. So I think any time that someone is trying to use their control to create an impression that's not true, that's where you're getting in trouble with potentially creating a situation where candidates are gonna come in and be really disappointed or disgruntled. If you're simply taking a wide body of information, picking and choosing a couple examples, you know, really, again, trying to highlight what you want to highlight, but in a way that still speaks to the reality of your culture, that's great. That's fantastic. I mean, candidates don't necessarily want to be, you know, swimming through 150 different stories. They want a couple. They just want them to be authentic. That makes total sense. I mean, and the other thing is that we've been doing a lot of surveying data. We've been just surveying tech professionals mostly about kind of their preferences and the things that are attracting them to companies and things like that. And one of them is actually this this might actually be the biggest element right now. Um, remote work, hybrid work versus being forced to come to an office for five days a week. Um during the pandemic, a lot of companies out of necessity, everybody is working remotely and they kind of shifted their entire configuration to all remote work. And now, and some of them even promised that this was going to be the situation going forward. Dice's offices are right next to Salesforce. So I ended up talking to Salesforce's engineers and developers a lot. Um, and a lot of them were talking about how Salesforce is like, you know, you could choose to come in, but you'll never have to come in if you don't want to. And now they're shifting again. And so, you know, they want everybody to come into the office at least a few days a week. And they're not alone. I mean, there's tons of tech companies and a lot of companies in the broader economy doing that as well. Um, in terms of this whole push-pull, do you think that remote work, hybrid work, and so on, I mean, do you think that these are things that are going to be winnowed down? Or do you think it's something that's going to kind of remain a robust part of office culture? Because it seems like the next generation of job seekers, I mean, they really want it. They really want that flexibility. But a lot of executives are like, it seems like they're almost souring on it a little bit. I mean, yeah. just what do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting time where a lot of different forces are acting on the market. And I think we're still learning a lot about how it's going to play out. But here, here are some of my thoughts and observations. So first of all, um, yeah, the the desire for flexibility is very strong among workers, and it's especially strong among women and among workers with more diverse backgrounds. So the Muse has a, a very, very diverse uh, kind of user base. Um, we're about 63% women, 58% identify as person of color. Um, only 19% of our users want to go back in full time, and then about 40% want to be hybrid and 40% want to be fully remote. Funnily enough, um, so we acquired Fairy Godboss last year, which is one of the largest online career communities for women. And for Fairy Godboss uh, users, again, all female, I believe, I'm not looking at the data right now, but I believe it was like 50% want to be fully remote, 49% want to be hybrid, and only 1% want to be completely back in the office. And we're about to run that survey again soon, so we'll have some updated data. But you know that kind of clear preference from a lot of job seekers and, and employees is as you said, it's running up against employers saying, um, I want you back in. And I think what we're seeing is like, you know, so many aspects of employment are, are, are a give take, a push pull. I think that you're going to see some companies that want people back in the office that are going to be able to get it because they offer other things that candidates want. People are willing, at least enough people are willing to forego the flexibility preference. Um, I think you'll see other companies that 
really struggle to get great people. They may have to settle for losing a lot of the candidates that they want because they're not offering flexibility and they're not offering enough other things to compensate. And again, the labor force isn't, you know, sort of unified. It's not like everybody wants the same five things. For some people, flexibility is most important. For some people, comp is most important. For some people, prestige is most important, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I was actually joking in uh, 2021 that we should call it the great reshuffle instead of the great resignation, because most people are not removing themselves from the workforce, other than a few people who are retiring early or moving into the gig force. Most people are simply leaving an employer that doesn't align with their preferences and moving to a new employer that is more aligned with something specific that they value. And so I think companies are going to have to decide, you know, if we want people back in the office, okay, great. Um, are we willing to lose out on a large portion of the talent pool? Are we willing to offer other incentives or other benefits that will make people who might otherwise not consider us be willing to forego flexibility because of these other things? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to solve a problem. You just can't get everything you want for nothing. And that includes employers that want their people to come back into the office and they want to retain a highly diverse, highly engaged you know, workforce of top performers. Again, you can do it, but I think the smart companies are thinking a lot about what motivates their people. Um, and some companies are saying, we're going to lose a lot of people and that's okay. Um, I think that's fine. Again, there's, there's room in the world for plenty of companies that want people back in the office five days a week. But what data says about the workforce is there's not room in the world for all of the companies to do that and also keep top performers because a lot of top performers just from the numbers are, are looking for a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, no, and that makes total sense. I mean, also, despite all the, the economic turbulence and everything like that, I mean, it seems that employees, especially in tech and what we've been seeing, are, are, are completely happy to leave. Like it, it does like rising or lowering unemployment doesn't really affect people's willingness to walk out the door. And I think companies have to consider it, especially if they have, you know, for example, when we run surveys, people who have highly specialized skills, machine learning, AI, data science, et cetera. I mean, you can go pretty much anywhere and you have the leverage to demand whatever you're going to demand. So I don't think, you know, that's, that's really an issue. Um, in terms of, but and that sort of flows into the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is, I mean, the Muse, a lot of your content focuses on professional development. And what we write about a lot at DICE is professional development in the context of specializing, not only in tech skills, but also in soft skills like teamwork and so on. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, in terms of the skills that are sort of being emphasized right now, especially with the rise of chat GPT and AI, which might remove certain kind of, you know, for people who code, it's going to potentially eliminate low-level coding. For other jobs, it might streamline things. What are you seeing as particularly important, especially for the next generation of job seekers in terms of skills and professional development? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, chat GPT-4 has been fascinating in terms of all of the, frankly, I would say human creativity, it's unlocking. People are using it to draft 20 different versions of their cover letter. Or they're using it to, you know, craft answers to questions or write blog posts or all sorts of fun things. And I think um, that sort of creativity, curiosity, and agility, which at this point are still fairly uniquely human skills, um, I think that that we're starting to see this sort of divergence in the market between what I would call sort of like repetitive work or rote work, which frankly, AI is, is very rapidly getting better at than the average human. And then um, creative work, strategic work, care work, um, problem solving work, a lot of types of, of other work that uh, we have not figured out how to use computers to replace. And so, you know, I would encourage, frankly, if, if someone's afraid of ChatGPT4 or curious about it, either way, I would, I would encourage people to read about it a bit, play around with it. It is, it is going to be a big part of our future. So getting comfortable with it at even a small level early is very helpful. Um, I would also say again, you know, I think that for individuals who are open to continuous learning, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to add skills and evolve in directions that AI is not going to immediately be able to come for. That said, like, I think we're, we're seeing the end of a career path in certain professions where you could just learn one set of skills, you know, in high school, vocational school or college, and then not have to update those. Unfortunately, like computers are coming for some of the old knowledge and we have to be kind of willing and committed 
to keep learning um, and to, to keep evolving to stay ahead of that. Yeah. I was, I was actually talking to a, um, uh, a cloud architect for a startup the other day. And I, I questioned like, you know, how much devastation is this going to cause to white collar jobs? And he, and it, he, his answer stunned me. He said, it's not going to cause any destruction at all. And I was like, oh, that's, that's obviously an optimistic perspective. And he said that, you know, depending on how things go and granted, I mean, we're still very early days on that kind of thing, but it'll free up people so that their professional development can focus more on creativity and innovation and project management and things that don't involve like kind of that rote work. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's, it's fascinating and it is a little, I mean, for, especially for people who specialize in coding or writing or things that, you know, can be generated by the current generation of tools. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating. Um, it really is. <laughs> So, I mean, the other thing I wanted to, to ask about is that a lot of workers now, I mean, you and you brought this up at the very beginning of the conversation where some people just want to go in and, you know, kind of punch the metaphorical time clock and do their job and get paid and get out. But then there's a lot of workers out there who, you know, especially post pandemic, want a sense of purpose. They want a sense of they're, they're, they're urgent about kind of doing something that they feel contributes to the world. Um, but the question is, I mean, when I talk to a lot of job seekers, particularly younger job seekers, when we do AMAs on Reddit or things like that, a lot of them are very confused about how to actually find purpose or how to kind of narrow down what they're doing, especially in the early stages of their career. Um, and the Muse has written to that topic a bunch. And so I'm just curious about your thoughts on it, because I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a vital thing to a lot of people. Yeah, it is. And I think... Um, you know, I think people often confuse two important and related but different questions. One is, how do I find a sense of purpose? And another is, how do I ensure that I enjoy what I do professionally? And the thing is, some people are going to need a clear sense of purpose at their professional roles in order to enjoy what they need to do professionally. There will be other people who might find their sense of purpose outside of their job in a hobby, in caregiving or family, um, in activism, in some other realm, and they can really enjoy what they do if it meets certain other criteria that allow them, again, to, to kind of architect the life that they want. And so I love to ask people to start any career search or job search with just a simple inventory of what are some of the things that matter most to you. Um, I think, you know, I, I wrote a book, The New Rules of Work um, with oh, yeah. my co-founder at The Muse, and we actually put a, a kind of Muse grid in there <laughs> with a bunch of different you know, adjectives and attributes that we've heard over the years um, individuals say, you know, these are my career priorities. These are some of the things that matter so that people can look through and kind of circle the ones that resonate and then start to assess, okay, you know, for some people, again, you know, creativity in their job is incredibly important, a variety. Other people, uh, prestige, high compensation, you know, some people um, really love kind of a fast paced environment where they're working with others. Um, other people really enjoy solo, deep, deep, deep focused work. Whatever it is that you align on, the more clarity you have about what matters, the more likely you are to be able to point your career in a direction that gives you that. And by the way, again, that that can be a big sense of purpose. Earlier in my career, I worked at a nonprofit that was helping roll out new vaccines um, across you know Western Africa. Um, that was, in one hand, incredibly meaningful work in terms of the impact we had. On the other hand, I spent most of my day working in Microsoft Word. Um, or Microsoft Excel, not having a lot of interaction with others um, and kind of helping to move things very slowly but surely through government bureaucracy, which ultimately didn't fit my need for you know high activity, constant learning, fast paced action, whatever you want to call it. So uh, anyway, I could talk about this for an hour. I'll wrap it up. Essentially, I think that um, when you can get clear on what matters to you, you can go find it. If you're not sure what matters to you, there are, there are resources that can help. The Muse has talked about this. Um, the book has a big section, you know, at the beginning, I think it's chapter one or two um, of the new rules of work. Um, and also, you know, talking to family and friends and asking them, when do you see me in flow state? When, um, you know, when do you see me 
at my most fulfilled. Um, I would not take anyone else's opinion over your own. You know yourself best, but it can be a helpful way of getting some ideas and gut checking. Um, and then once you have a bit more clarity, you can ask targeted questions in the interview process or do your internet research in a very intentional way to try and assess, does this job allow me to use my creativity? Does this job come with you know the, the elements that are most important to me? Cool. And that's it, folks. As you just heard, there's a lot of reason for optimism out there. The news headlines seem focused on layoffs and the possibility of a recession, but companies are still hungry for talent, and job candidates have a lot of opportunities out there. Here are a few other takeaways from our discussion. First, even though there are widespread fears of an economic recession, job candidates still expect to be able to vocalize their preferences and have their top priorities met by their prospective employers. Many of these candidates want a sense of purpose and the opportunity for growth. That means companies still need to provide the benefits, perks, and mission that candidates want. Second, employees aren't willing to stick in a job that they hate, especially if they have highly specialized skills that make them valuable. Many employees are experiencing shift shock, where a new job's reality doesn't match up to their expectations going in. Some 72% of those surveyed by the Muse had experienced this phenomenon at some point. To avoid this kind of mismatch, companies must be honest, accurate, and straightforward about company culture and what they're actually offering candidates. Third, if you're a tech professional, or any other kind of worker, on the job hunt, take the time to do a personal inventory and figure out your career priorities. For example, do you want a position that allows you to engage in deeply focused work, or do you want to work constantly with a team? Are you willing to sacrifice a chance at higher compensation in order to work for a particular cause? Once you perform that sort of breakdown, you can get a better sense of the moves you need to make to have a truly fulfilling career. And that's it, folks. We covered a whole lot of other topics, of course, so give the episode a re-listen if there was something you missed. And we'll see you next time. Remember, DICE is your best resource to find the tech talent you need to fill your open roles, and for technology professionals, the best place to grow your tech career. 